Thank you very much for in inviting me. I really, really appreciate that. In spite of my treacherous, treacherous ways of leaving the Mass Stats Department, they're still allowing me to come here and talk in their form, and that's great. Uh, speaking of the, the uh, talking loudly, uh, some of my students said, they're putting a microphone on you, because after all, if they've ever been in a class with mine, and you had a microphone on, it would be a very scary thing. I, I always relish the classrooms that have a microphone because then I really get to really hear myself echo off the walls because I do like listening to myself speak sometimes. Okay, so we're going to talk about analytics. And uh, like Karen said, I'm an instructor in the School of Business. And I teach the Citizen Sciences. Now, before we get too far into analytics, I kind of want to do a quiz. I want to ask you a question. I want you to pick between option A and option B. And just so you know, there's no right or wrong answer. Sometimes uh, whether you pick option A or pick option B is sort of an indication of what kind of person you are, not your personality, but uh, just what do you prefer? Without doing a lot of, you know, looking for the catch, because there is no catch, who would pick option A? Okay, so about 15 or so. Option B. Okay, so about 25. Okay, so all of you who picked option B, who buy insurance, put up your hand. Why did you lie to me? <laughs> all right. If you're an option A person, that's people who buy insurance, you're a little risk averse. If you're not risk averse, you're an option B person. Uh, but that's okay. Okay, now C and D. Uh, push C and D. Option C. Okay. Oh, one, sorry. Option D. Okay. Very interesting. Okay. Just try it again. Nothing tricky. It's just a matter of sense of of uh, what you're thinking as your thinking patterns are in regards to analytics. Okay, so as you may have guessed, and I could tell from the mathematical audience that you're trying to work through a million, and then you're trying to find the expected value of B, and oh my gosh, and, and doing all that good stuff, and you got 1.39, and, and big deal if you did, it really didn't matter. Okay, so if you picked A, you picked B, that, there's no right or wrong answer, just a matter of whether you're risk averse or not. Okay, so for instance, if you picked, uh, if you picked A, you were doing what we call in uh, economics maximizing utility, which is a big fancy word for saying maximizing happiness. Okay, whereas if you're picking B, you're more likely maximizing expected value. Doesn't matter. Okay, so normally, thank you for messing this up, uh, but normally people pick A over B. But we'll arrange it because I, I had to make an assumption as to what type of person you were when I made the slides up. So I assumed you were normal and I guess I was wrong. Okay, so if we just switch that sign and go, okay, the happiness that you get from that whole big, long, complicated version B gave you more happiness than A. Then just switch that sign, doesn't matter. So B was giving you more happiness than A. All right, so that's fine. Now we just do just a little bit of rearranging on this B thing and this A thing. And all I've done is I've taken that 0.89 times by the utility of a million out of both sides just to kind of you know streamline it towards a certain goal. Well, we add this 0.89 times utility that you get absolutely nothing to both sides and essentially what we get is we get C is better than D if you like A is better than B. So here we're good. D we'd expect you if you liked B you want to like D if you like A you want to like A. For those of you who didn't that's bad. You're irrational. And that's okay. Uh, but we're fairly consistent, although it seems like choosing between A and B did not frighten us near as much as C and D. Okay. So that tells me we're nice. We're fairly rational people. I, we're fairly consistent. This analytic stuff's going to work out just fine for us. Okay. So why do we want to talk a little bit of analytics? And sometimes it's because often our decision making is not very consistent. So the way we naturally process choices, not always in the most optimal way. So there's kind of three things where we, in the three major things where we go wrong. And availability, and that's just where, you know what? We recall stuff in the more recent past better than we call, recall stuff 
in the more distant past, right? So things, if I asked you, hey, what can you tell me about Anton Lander? Where's number 51? Where's number 51? Did you watch the game yesterday? How did you do yesterday? Awesome. Great player, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. But he got three points. How did he do two games ago? Probably not three points, but who the hell knows? Who even knew who this guy was? I, didn't even, I hadn't even heard of him until, hey, he scored he got three points yesterday. Awesome, right? Why? Because, hey, he just played yesterday. It's more uh, in my more recent past, okay? Also, we tend to recall things that are more sensational. So the more sensational or vivid things are, the more we recall. So we don't recall that guy who just plays nice and... Uh, regular and consistent, but maybe not spectacularly. But we crawl somebody who just had a super game, and then we sort of sometimes forget those, you know, four really awful games or that uh, horrible uh, pass that he made in the second period or something like that that led to a goal. Okay, so availability, big thing. Representativeness. Now I love the representativeness because this is where we hate randomness because we hate uncertainty. So what do we do? We attach reason to uncertainty. So, for instance, guy is skating along, he's got a stick down, pass, bunt, bounces off his stick into the, into the net. Okay, great, he's a superstar. He anticipated where the puck was going, his head is in the game, his heart is in the game, all that kind of good stuff. What the heck was that? It was just randomness, right? He just plays the game, plays his positional hockey the same way he's always does. It just happens that the stick and the puck matched up on that current time. So... Uh, I love the quote that, speaking of Anton Lander again, he gave uh, after the game last night where he got those three points. And he says, all I do is I participate in the four check. I try to skate hard. I go towards the net and I keep my stick down and sometimes it bounces in my favor. Perfect statistical analysis of hockey. Uh, again, I'd never heard of this guy before, I have to confess. But wow, hey, awesome. I need him as a guest speaker. Okay, so last thing is anchoring. Anchoring is where we make that, that first judgment on those initial first few seconds. So if you're a Malcolm Gladwell person, you read that book, Blink, and you make a first impression in the first two seconds, which is why we have the donuts here. Because you come in here and you grab the donuts and you have a good first impression. Because once I stop talk, start talking, all that goes out the window, and then you leave and you go, hmm. Donuts. All right. Now, did he say something stupid? Mmm, donuts. Okay, so this is good because this protects me, except for the guy with the camera here who's filming it, and then uh, I got no place to hide after that. Okay, so anchoring, but sometimes we don't adjust that anchor. So we make that first impression based on faulty uh, information, and then when we get new information, we can be a little bit slow in making that adjustment to that new information. Okay, so those of you that are, uh, you know, on the, uh, you know, the Facebook committee to remove Kevin Lowe uh, think that Daryl Cates is using anchoring here. He sort of, I'm not saying this by the way, but he sort of thinks, ah, Kevin was good one time, or could have been good, uh, not so good last year, not so good the year before, but it's maybe slow to make that adjustment. I don't know. Am I in a group full of Kevin Lowe fans here? No, Okay. That's okay. I'm not criticizing Kevin Lowe. Okay. All righty. So kind of just again, a little bit more on, on how our decision making is kind of a little bit wonky and then we'll get into some, uh, some serious stats. Okay. So this is uh, GM, uh, Oakland A's uh, uh, GM, Billy Bean. So they did a whole movie about him, Moneyball, wrote a book about Moneyball and stuff like that. If you saw the movie, you remember Brad Pitt and you're looking up and you're saying, that's not Brad Pitt. <laughs> Because uh, it's not. It's, uh, it's, it's Billy Bean. That's what he actually looks like. I mean, they say he's ugly. I, I don't know. I mean, he's not Brad Pitt, but he's not so bad. But again, he says, I hate losing more than I love winning. Now, even though he's an analytic superhero, again, there's, there's a problem with that, right? And maybe that's why he, uh, he appreciates the, 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 the wonder, I guess, of analytics, is that he kind of knows that there are some things that clunk around in our head a little bit funky. Okay. So the last thing is we have, I hate to use fancy terminology, but an asymmetric value function. What that means is, I hate losing more than I like winning. That's all it means. Now that in and of itself is not a bad thing. Hating losing more than you like winning is okay. 
but sometimes we don't necessarily assess things in the proper way. So for instance, two scenarios. I give you $100. Oh, you're happy, right? You go home, you find a bill for $80. You're angry. <laughs> if I give you $20 and you go home and there's a bill for $0 there, should you be the same amount happy? But you're not. You're way more angry here, right? Even though you're $20 ahead either way. And of course, it doesn't, they don't have to go very far beyond um, the gas pumps to kind of get a sense for that. Gas prices go down from about a buck five to, you know, where they are right now, 82 cents. But they were at 70 before. Now they've gone up. And we're being ripped off. And we're mad. We don't look at the fact that, hey, it's 30 cents less than it was, th you know, four months ago. No, it just went up 16 cents. I don't like it. So we get that where, you know what, we hate again that losing, but we don't look at it in total. We value that bad thing disproportionate to the good thing, okay? It's not like we waited. And that gets to become important when we start to evaluate hockey players or any sports athletes, right? There are good things that they do and there are bad things that they do. And you really want to evaluate the total package, but that's just not the way we instinctively look at things. Pulling the goalie in hockey. Anybody tell me when is the optimal time to pull a goalie? You're down one goal. When should you pull the goalie? No. You're going to lose. Yes. Five. The optimal time when you're down one goal. And there was a, there's a whole bunch of Markov probabilities and Poisson processes and all this that have another donut. We can talk about it. Okay, no then, and this is this play, they, of course we're not providing liquor, so I won't get into Markov processes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but that's when, about five minutes, remember what, uh, Patrick Watt pulled the goalie with three minutes, I remember the guys on CBC tittering and blah blah blah, and, da, 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 and going all crazy. But if you want to have about a 50% probability of winning the game, that's when you're pulling the goalie. Anybody ever see the goalie pulled down one goal with five minutes remaining? Never seen it. Well, Patrick Waugh was down three goals when he was a coach of the Ramparts. He pulled the goalie when he had a power play 12 minutes left. Got skewered over it because what happens? What do you figure happened when you pulled the goalie with 12 minutes to go? What likely happened? The other guy scored, right? And of course you get slammed for making the wrong decision. So coaches that can't tend to be a little bit on the conservative side. They don't look at this problem the way you guys did where you sort of prefer just an expected return. No, they were way over here. They act this way. Now, I don't know if that means that means the sports fan acts this way too, but maybe, right? So we get the sense for, hey, pulling that goalie ought to do it a lot earlier than you do. Nobody does, okay? All right. Uh, if you're curious, the, the uh, Average, you score about one goal every eight and a half minutes if you are six on five and you have the man advantage. So on average, you'll score a goal in eight and a half minutes. Okay, what else? Okay, so let's kind of get into a little bit of the math. So we've kind of acknowledged that perhaps maybe the decision making instinctively in our heads has got some pluses and minuses to it. Now let's talk a bit about uh, how, do we, how do we address this? How do we start to evaluate some numbers? So uh, Bill Jeans in... in, in uh, in baseball, sort of came up with this formula, and uh, for all my math friends, I know it says Pythagorean winning formula. There's no geometry to this, okay? In fact, Pythagorean really has nothing to do with it. The only reason why it's Pythagorean is, first of all, Bill James thinks it sounds cool, okay? <laughs> and he experimentally designed it or came up with it, and this gamma here, uh, he postulated was two. So there was some squaring and it sort of had a Pythagorean look to it. Okay? But you know what? It's not necessarily that this gamma is related to, uh, is necessarily two. Although for hockey, it's very, very close. And we'll talk about that in a sec. The key thing is when we talk about winning percentage, which is what this measures, is this goal ratio is extremely important. Okay? So this ratio of goals against the goals for 
is a very, very key component, and it's really what we want. Goal differentials is what we're all about when we start doing analytics, is how we want to have maximize that goal differential. How do we project it? How do we talk about it? How do we analyze it? How do we digest it? Okay. So a couple of things is there is a little bit of a bias in this Pythagorean calculation. Anybody think of what do we do in hockey that we don't do in basketball or baseball? What happens in overtime? What happens in the shootout? We got the pity point, right? So everybody wins if there's a shootout. Everybody wins or gets something or goes away with a gift bag if we have overtime. Not so much in basketball and, and not at all in baseball. Okay? So we have a little bit of a bias and I ran some numbers and I, I adjusted that bias. You know. and it's about 0 0.058. So we have an intercept. So I kind of added, a, you know, cheated a little bit and, and added a little bit to this. Just to reflect the fact that there's that overtime shootout component that doesn't make this formula work exactly as advertised in the hockey context. But it gives us an exponent in about 1.95. Okay? And if you're really excited about got confidence intervals and all that kind of good stuff, you're looking at a confidence interval between about 1.85, a 95% confidence interval between about 1.85 and about 2.15. So you know, two would fall in that confidence interval. Okay? R squared of 87%, which says, you know, suggests that about 87% of that change in winning percentage can be explained by this goal differential idea. Now, I guess just as an aside, uh, you know, this was a this is a very non-linear model, uh, so traditional linear regression stuff can't be done. But you know, non-linear regression is not really that much scarier than linear regression when you have a computer next to you. It's just more of an iterative process, and there's some fancy terminology, and you gotta you gotta pick some you know which iterative process you want to use and stuff like that. And for a simple model like this, I used about three different ones, and they all basically produced the same result. So here we go. Okay, so we all remember this wonderful uh, press conference that Craig McTavish gave on uh, December the 5th of last year where he said, and I quote, to me anyway, we are a better hockey team. So let's kind of look at what that means. Okay, so last year, how did we do? Well, uh, we won about 41% of the time, or of the possible points available, we got 41% of them. Woohoo! Now, the formula predicted that we'd get 42 Okay, so we're like a fraction of a game off, okay, so there was that one bad bounce late in the third period and we lost one more game than we thought, okay, no big deal. All right, so now let's see how we did this year. All right, so at the time of the press conference, uh, we're at 3.33, a uh, little bit bad, worse than last year. However, good news, we were expected to be 0.385. So yeah, we sucked, right? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll later on, I'll try to redeem Craig a little bit. And, but not looking like we're doing a better right there, huh? Okay, so hey, we're about half a point out. If you were to extend that to the whole season, we're about, you know, four wins short. All right, that's not good. It's eight points. Okay, let's uh, check our Canadian compatriots. And of course, uh, you know, we've got Edmonton, but then we can't talk about any Canadian team without our most wonderful Canadian team, the Montreal Canadiens, of course. Um, and we see, hey, you know, expected 0.615. This is just before the All-Star break, by the way. And hey, we're actually beating expectations. Woo, any Montreal Canadiens fans? Just me, awesome. Okay, now you may ask, whoa, wow, that's 6%. That's quite the difference, and we can all blame that on Carey Price, okay? Uh, Vancouver! Hey, Vancouver! Anybody here like Vancouver? Oh, there's that one person. And then there's the kid with the Vancouver hat, the Vancouver shirt, the Vancouver sneakers, and the Vancouver socks on, too. Uh, I think he likes Vancouver. Uh, so pretty close, right? So Vancouver, if you're a Vancouver fan, you're about on target. If you don't like where you are, you're probably not getting any better. Okay? Winnipeg fans! Any Winnipeg fans there? Oh, uh oh too bad for Winnipeg. Can't drink the water, and guess you can't cheer for their hockey team. <laughs> okay, uh, Winnipeg about right on. Okay, so not so bad. Toronto, uh, this season, what they expect, and you know, as is typical with a Toronto Maple Leafs fan, or Ma Ma Maple Leafs team, you are performing below expectations. <laughs> um, and of course, you're following him lately, it's not getting any better. Uh, Calgary, 
Now well, we expect them actually to be better. So all you guys who think Calgary is special, eh, you're actually a little underperforming. It's a kind of disappointing. Flames fans? Oh darn, I wanted to talk about how, why the Flames are not going to make the playoffs later. <laughs> okay, so we could kind of see how other teams are working. Alrighty, so listening to the radio one time. And, uh, of course, it's always scary when you listen to hockey on the radio. Um, so, heard some guys say, only the Oilers had average goaltending. Not great goaltending. We're not expecting uh, Pika Rennie or Carey Price here. Just, just run-of-the-mill, lunch-bucket goalie. Okay? Okay. We would be okay. We'd be in the hunt. We'd be just there. I just know it. Okay, let's look at Edmonton. So average save uh, percentage in the NHL, about 91%. Edmonton hovering around 89th percent. Not so good. In fact, there's nobody worse than us. Um, however, good news, good news. Hey, if we were to have just average gold intending, so our save percentage, same as everybody else's. Look at that. Look at our winning percentage. Look at how much it goes up. We'd be in 13th place. This is awesome! We're in 13th place now. 13th is just a little bit further away from a first round, first pick in the draft. <laughs> Damn! <laughs> Scrivens, take the night off. Don't worry about it. Don't get so stressed out. All right. All right. So, so far, things aren't not looking good for Edmonton. Awesome for the Habs, though. But you don't care. All right. So, when we first look at that Pythagorean win, uh, winning uh, percentage, goal ratio was the key component. Now the problem we have with goals is they don't happen very often. Right? Sadly, we wish they would happen more often, but they don't happen very often. So the problem is when we have small sample sizes, there's this thing that starts with a V that we really hate, that's sort of our super villain of statistics. Anybody willing to guess what it is? Variance, variability, we hate variability. Who said that? I'm just curious. Awesome, awesome. So Dr. Variability is our supervillain here. Just as an aside, do you notice how every supervillain has a PhD? <laughs> just, just saying, just saying. Okay, so Dr. Variability is our problem. So sometimes goals, they happen in bunches, they happen, they're streaky, um, and so sometimes they're not necessarily easy for us to make predictions based on because there's a little bit of variability. Do you know what the sports word for variability is? Luck. Bad and good. Okay. So what do we care? So we said shots are important, shot differentials are key, and then that leads us into sort of a lot of what we're going to talk about is what's a shot? Yeah. Do you have to hit the net for it to be a scoring opportunity? If it rings off the post, does that make it meaningless? Versus some little flopper that kind of lands at the goalie's feet, we call that a shot. Something going 487 miles an hour that rings off the post is somehow not a scoring opportunity. So here's where we start to enter in this world of uh, Corsi and Fenwick. Okay. So what's Corsi? So it's named after Jim Corsi. Uh, he was a goaltending coach, or is a goaltending coach, excuse me. And it was intended to measure goaltending effort. Because the goalie's got to get all the line, he's got to get all positioned, he's got to go for the, sh you know, play the shot, regardless of whether it gets blocked by somebody in front of him, regardless of whether it rings off the post, or if it goes two inches to the right, or two inches to the left, the goaltender still has to expend that effort. So he was trying to measure goaltending effort to see when his goal goalies are getting tired and so on, so forth. So. We, uh, we sort of extended that definition that he has in that we don't look at just shots on goal. It doesn't have to just hit the net, but it has to be directed towards the net. And that could be shots that just miss the net, shots that are blocked by a defenseman, or shots that actually go in goals. Okay, so we look at a more broader view of what we consider a shot. Now we do look at uh, we measure this Corsi when teams are at even strength. And the reason why is what are we trying to get at or what are we trying to measure when we start looking at shots? And what we're trying to measure is puck possession. Because at its very root, how complicated is hockey? Not. You have the puck, your chance of scoring is higher than the guy who doesn't have the puck. 
If the other guy doesn't have the puck, his probability of scoring goes down quite a bit, right? Goes down to zero. So puck possession is key. And so when we talk about Corsi, we talk about Fenwick, we're really a proxy for puck possession. If you have the puck, your chance of scoring goes up. Your opponent's chance of scoring uh, goes down quite a bit, okay? Now what's nice with these shots is we have a large sample size. So we get to work with a large sample size. They're less variable, so luck is not necessarily as big a component. Not saying it's not a component, there's still variability, but it's less than it is for goals, which allows us to perhaps make a little bit better predictions. Okay, so key thing with Corsi, shots on goal, shots that miss the net, shots that are blocked, and of course shots that go in. And then we have Fenwick, which is the same thing, except with the thinking with Fenwick is uh, that blocking shots is an important defensive play. And as we saw over here, shots that are blocked, that's a shot. So that's a shot against you under the Corsi definition. But under Fenwick, the definition considers that shot to be an important defensive play. Is it an important defensive play? Is it a good defensive play? Is blocking a shot a good defensive play? That's the question I ask you. You say no. Can I ask you why? If okay. Because there would have there would have been less chance of it being an actual goal if they had defended it before. Absolutely. Yes. So if you had if they didn't have the puck in the first place, because remember, we're all about puck possession. If you pull it when you block a shot, that's a sign the other guy had the puck. We don't like that. Right? So sometimes a block shot, it, at the end of it is good, and I know Don Cherry loves it, but it's a signal that perhaps the other team had the puck, their probability of scoring has gone up. Okay? So not necessarily that this block shot thing is a sign of a good defensive play. The better defensive play is if you took the puck away from them before they shot. Okay. So let's kind of look at some correlations here. So we have our, uh, our Corsi 4, so these are shots in uh, offensive shots versus actual goals 4. Corsi 4 versus actual goals 4, Corsi against and Fenwick against because these are shots taken against you. So, uh, you know, moderately, pretty highly correlated, so around 0 0.8, 0 0.84 in about that neighborhood. So there is some correlation, a pretty good correlation between uh, these Corsi and Fenwick statistics and actual goals scored. Now, the key thing I provide, so I want to put, is these are all five on five. So again, Corsi Fenwick really focuses in on five on five. No power plays, nothing like that. Actually, when you start looking at Corsi's for and against on the power play, it all falls apart. I mean, it's presumed that the team with the power play has got the superior puck possession. Okay, so it really doesn't tell us a lot. Okay, so now often as well, taking this Corsi uh, four percentage just a little bit further. Sometimes it's represented as a percentage, so Corsi 4%. And so we just look at that, our Corsi 4, and then in the denominator, we have a Corsi 4 and a Corsi against, and we express that as a percentage. Okay, so sometimes, a lot of times, you see that CF percent. Okay, that's just your ratio of your Corsi 4 to a combined uh, Corsi 4 and Corsi against. Okay, so it's a percentage. This is a kind of a nice all purpose number to see what kind of balance a given team has. Okay, and you can even use that to see what kind of balance a given player has too. Okay, so we look at Edmonton uh, January the 30th. I just looked it up just before I came here. Corsi 4, 49. That's 10th best. That's not that far. Eighth gets us in the playoffs. 10th. Craig McTavish, maybe he's got something to, maybe, maybe it's not all bad. Maybe the Oilers are just at the cusp. Right now, our Corsi 4 is tied with Vancouver. We're as good as Vancouver. 20th overall. Good enough not to make the playoffs. Bad enough that we don't get a good draft pick. <laughs> Yay. Last year, our Corsi 4 percent was 44 We've gone from 44 to 49. It's a big improvement. Kevin Lowe's awesome. <laughs> Sign him up, renew the contract. Right, Matt? Absolutely. Okay. I have one last statistic I want to I talk about. 
And uh, people who know trust PTO, I'm stealing from the commercial, I don't know. I, 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 I teach a lot of accountants, so you know, BDO, people who know trust BDO. No, okay. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, so PDO, what the heck is PDO? Well, PDO doesn't stand for anything, by the way. So if you're trying to look at puck, defense, offense, or puck, it's not going to matter. It's named after a guy. Again, you know, standard rule. You, you, you invent it. You get to name it. It's like our Pythagorean winning uh, percentage. Okay. I had a stats instructor who uh, derived the test, named it after his cat. You get to derive it. You get to name it. So long-term average, so this is a save percentage. So you should shot save percentage um, and plus your shooting percentage. Okay, so the percentage of shots on your goalie that your goalie saves uh, plus the percentage of shots that you take that you score. Okay. So long-term, that average is about 100. And it's actually fairly consistent across teams. Now, this is a rate. I'm not saying that uh, if uh, Nashville has a score of 100 and Buffalo has a score... Uh, of 100 that necessarily we're saying that those teams are equivalent. It means that really things all come down to shots. Okay, more shots, more goals on average. Nothing more complicated than that. Okay? You get a little bit above that, it's sort of like a stand-in for luck. You got a little bit lucky. Your goalie was saving a little bit more than you expected, or you were scoring a little bit more than you expected. So, Oilers score. So when we have, uh, and we look at it, sorry, I should just digress a little bit. When you look at those teams with scores over 100, they're considered lucky. And one thing about when you've been lucky so far, things balance out. It's that nasty demon called regression towards the mean. So if you're a little bit above the mean now, what inevitably at some point must happen? You return to reality, right? You're not that good. And this is where we get into Calgary. Okay, anyway, so when you look at Calgary's Corsi 4, you look at Calgary's luck, man, they're just lucky. They're going down. Sorry, if you've got the flames, cut it. Dump it. Don't bet on the flames to make the playoffs. The flames are not making the playoffs. But sometimes these are a little, can be a little bit skewed too. So for instance, I was mentioning Nashville and Montreal before. Nashville and Montreal both have very high PDOs, but they also have very high percentage save goalies. Okay, so they have goalies that are just woo, way above everybody else in, in that uh, shot save percentage. Uh, and so they kind of deviate from this. Because Montreal's Corsi 4 percentage score is abysmal. It's worse than Edmonton's. No way they should be anywhere near a playoff spot. So when uh, Carey Price comes to negotiate for a new contract, he's going to get whatever the hell he wants, okay? I can tell you that much. Oilers score for this year. What do you figure? How much luck have we had? We have had no luck. We have had the worst luck. We're at 97. And Calgary's at 102, by the way. So we all know regression towards the mean. We see Calgary dropping. They're going to drop a little further. Edmonton is going to go up, but like I said before, we're going to go up just enough that our probability of getting that first draft pick is going to go down. All right? So we're not good enough to make a playoff spot, but we're actually not as bad as you know sometimes we think. Okay. Any questions so far? Just have one last thing because I just have to put this slide up because it just sort of looks like an old Chesterfield. Uh, can't say anything without mentioning Don Cherry and statistics because, you know, Don Cherry has got a lot of statistical insight. And I've sort of edited this because, of course, Don Cherry doesn't say anything in nice little sound bites and stuff like that. So this is as small as I could get and still capture everything, but it's still pretty wordy. Okay, the, the essence is he doesn't like Corsi that much. Now, just to put it into context, I will give them uh, a little bit of, uh, of, uh, of deference in that Don McLean uh, sort of set him up a little, Ron McLean, excuse me, set him up a little bit, and uh, Don wasn't quite ready for the question and that kind of stuff. But the essential thing is Corsi is a flawed statistic. And in a lot of ways, Corsi is a flawed statistic. Hence why the whole Corsi family has now appeared. So we've got Corsi close, Corsi tie, something called Corsi QOC, Corsi rel, shots weighted by origination, whew, adjusted for zone starts. So we've kind of trying to take that Corsi and adjust it for a lot of its flaws. 
So Corsi close, as you can kind of guess, is we look at that Corsi statistics for and against, but we only look at when the game is plus or minus a goal. Okay, so if you're getting blown out by five goals, we don't count for this. If you're winning by three or four goals, we don't count. Because maybe there's just something special about your team that you're able to really perform, really control the puck when the game is right on the line. Okay? Corsi tied, same idea as Corsi close, of course, it's just that now the game's tied. Now, what's your Corsi for? What's your Corsi against, right? Because again, game is on the line. How do you perform when things are really, really tight? Corsi quality of competition. Okay, so maybe you kind of look and you're a big uh, Ovechkin fan and yeah, Corsi's awesome. Yeah, but of course he's awesome against bad teams, not so good against good teams, okay? So maybe you adjust it a little bit for the quality of the competition that you face. How does a given player do against the high level competition, okay? Corsi relative is now we start to get into something where these two were starting to get into individual players. This measures a team, that measures a team, and in a lot of ways Corsi measures how the team's strategy is performing, right? So it's, it's an evaluative method, okay? So Corsi Rel looks at the player relative to the rest of his teammates. How's the Corsi for that player relative to his team? Because if a player is on a team that maybe they're not a very good puck possession team, um, and so that player has a so-so or a mediocre Corsi, but relative to his teammates, he rocks. It just happens to be on a team that's just not a good puck possession team. Okay? This one is really cool because this is sort of new, is now we're trying to treat that all shots from where they come from aren't always equal. So that low angle shot is not the same as that shot from the slot. Okay? And uh, I remember uh, I was at uh, a Las Vegas 51s game. And one thing about, neat about going to AAA baseball is that all the stats guys are there, you know, from whether it's the Dodgers or the Mets or the A's, but they're basically sitting there in the stands. Okay? So you've got a guy in a laptop keeping track of statistics. Well, it's like giving a mouse cheese. So I go over and I chat, and they've got all sorts of neat little software where they keep track of where every ball is going on every pitch, right? Hockey, starting to think about doing that, starting to think about weighting those shots by, you know, some sort of probability of scoring or some sort of value, okay? That, and even in a, uh, and even, uh, f uh, sorry, Further to this is now we're starting to get into maybe keeping track, more video keeping track of how hard the shot was, what the angle the shot was, and so on. Okay? And in baseball, a little bit ahead of us in that sense, in that even in a AAA baseball stadium, there's nine cameras all situated around, keeping track of how fast the pitcher throws, how fast the hit is going, where is the hit going, and all that kind of good stuff. Okay? So, this is probably the, the next big thing in stats development when we start talking about analytics and hockey. And then we adjust for zone starts. For the, so that last thing is adjusting for zone starts, where the puck starts. Because sometimes you have some special players, and we can go back to Ryan Johnson that uh, Don Cherry is talking about here. And you know what, he has a role. You know, deal with things in his own end. Well, of course, you would expect his Corsi to be a little bit worse because he's dealing in the, he's, uh, he's playing or defending in the defensive zone more than he is in the offensive zone, okay? So sometimes we adjust for zone starts. The advantage of getting a, a face-off in the opposing end ends at about 7 or 12 seconds. So if you get, if there's a face-off in the opposing zone, your advantage lasts about 7 or 12 seconds, and then after that, you know, your advantage is pretty much uh, dissipated, okay? So sometimes, uh, some guys just start counting the Corsi's 10 seconds after a defensive or an offensive zone uh, face-off, okay? Whew, last thing, and then you don't have to listen to me speak anymore. So key points, goal differential is key to relay, is a key component of uh, winning percentage. Goals are hard to predict. So we have our friends Corsi and Fenwick, where we have larger sample sizes. They're correlated with puck possession and scoring anyway, but maybe just a little bit of variability and a very good projection of the future. So if you look at a team's 
uh, Corsi 4 or Corsi 4 percentage, that at this point, halfway through the season-ish, that is a very good predictor of where they will end up at the end of the year. Okay. Sometimes the numbers give conflicting results, as we see. In one measure, Edmonton is horrible. In one measure, Edmonton is you know, less than horrible. One measure, it looks like they've got no hope for the next several years. And then you look at some of those Corsi numbers, and it looks like it's maybe not so bad. All right. Any questions? Okay, so Corsi 4. I'll just continue talking. That's okay. I'm an instructor. I can go for hours. Sometimes I have to take a breath, but not often. Team of the best Corsi 4 last year. Who do you figure it was? They didn't do too bad. Los Angeles. Los Angeles. Awesome. In the year before that, Corsi 4, who played, anybody, oh, let's see how good the memory is. Who played in the Stanley Cup before last year? Boston, Chicago, awesome. Do you think they had the top, were in the top four for Corsi percentage? Absolutely. So consistently, who's in the top? Chicago. They've had some success. L.A., done all right. Boston, decent. And the last time the Jersey Devils were in the Stanley Cup final, their Corsi was awesome as well. I'm going to address one problem because uh, it comes up. And it, uh, how about Sidney Crosby? Any good? Not sure. Sidney Crosby is a kid from Cape Britain, Nova Scotia. Plays for Pittsburgh. A funny little orange shirt. Oh, yeah. Corsi numbers are, well, on the surface of it, suck. So do you think that makes him a bad player? No. And actually, his Corsi 4 percentage is pretty good relative to the Penguins' Corsi 4 percentage. So if you look at Sidney Crosby's Corsi 4 percent, it's about 53, and the Penguins in the high 40s somewhere. And when do you figure Sidney Crosby's best Corsi 4 stat was? The year he won the Stanley Cup. It was the only time Pittsburgh really had one that was half decent. Oh. Anyway, that's it for me. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. I appreciate you laughing at my lame jokes. <laughs>